So welcome to everybody. Today we have the pleasure to um, to host Marco as uh, Marco Gori, professor at University of Siena in artificial intelligence, uh, and to listen to his webinar on AI to AI. Um, Marco is uh, not only a colleague, it's a great friend uh, from University of Siena with whom we established different partnerships at the master level and today we have a master's students from the University of Nice from uh, Estia School of Engineering and Marco is one of the professor of the new uh, master degree on big data and artificial intelligence from Estia, BR Master. So um, it's a pleasure for me to listen with the students and with the other industry people to your seminar, uh, Marco, and I leave you now the opportunity to talk and then uh, students can uh, uh, anybody can ask questions uh, through the uh, the chat and uh, all the questions will be uh, delivered to Marco at the end of the talk. It's your turn, Marco. OK, thanks, Serge. Uh, thanks a lot for you know this opportunity of uh, offering my view on artificial intelligence uh, to, you know, uh, uh, and, and in an audience where you have at the same time students and people from companies, which is always, uh, you know, an interesting thing. So, um, yeah, of course, I'm also very pleased to experiment uh, this partnership uh, uh, with Estia. Essentially, we have activated, as uh, Serge uh, was saying, this uh, important collaboration with my university, uh, also in terms of students. And so it's a good opportunity today also for, you know, offering my view of, you know, what my understanding and you know projection for the few next few years on artificial intelligence so you can see in the title you know something which is uh, uh, i think uh, you know uh, uh, immediately should uh, uh, let's say uh, capture your attention you see uh, the title is from artificial intelligence from art to artificial intelligence but if you look at the you know if you look at the characters you have in the first case you have a big a right which is essentially stressing the importance of uh, artificial uh, in intelligence, right? So essentially, you know, you will see that uh, my claim here is that the, the years have come to, you know, move from methods and approaches where, you know, this uh, attribute of artificial it's, is going to decrease. And maybe, you know, we are doing all efforts for improving the component of intelligence so I'll, I'll i'll tell you more right during this talk that you know this is just to explain why you know there is this singular title right and you see from artificial intelligence to artificial intelligence but actually we are talking about you know small i and uh, you know big uh, a right which is exactly what uh, I'm, i want to address today okay so um Essentially, what you will see is some are some comments about you know what I'm uh, considering in artificial intelligence. One of the most interesting challenges nowadays. So the possibility at the same time to you know think of intelligence in terms of developmental intelligence, just like you know what hap the same you know that happens uh, in humans, for example. Uh, it's quite clear, right, that humans develop intelligence in a very, uh, let's say, gradual way, uh, whereas on the opposite, uh, you know, this is not the case in computers. So we will discuss today this issue. And, uh, you know, another important issue is how to bridge logic and learning, right? Uh, because we have a, a, a very important tradition, artificial intelligence concerning uh, symbolic reason. And, and which is rooted in logic and learning, which is mostly rooted in, uh, in statistics, right? And so a few comments on this. And uh, finally, you know, uh, since there are also people from companies, I will, uh, I will tell you a, a few comments, you know, on long term, um, you know, uh, possible direction in technology. Uh, so I will talk about a new framework of competition in science and technology. So uh, 
of course, uh, one of the reasons why we are here this afternoon is definitely because of the impressive uh, you know, evolution of deep learning, right? Which dramatically changed the picture of AI, no way, right? So deep learning, you know, come from very simple principles of supervised learning where I'm confident, you know, uh, all people in, in, in this uh, room, you know, uh, understand that there is a supervisor, right? Uh, which is essentially labeling uh, patterns, right? So roughly speaking, you are given a pattern. Uh, there is an internal representation into a computer, just like, in, like animals, right? Which uh, have an internal representation of pictures or maybe signals of any kind, okay? So the perception component uh, in, in computers very much remind us uh, of what happened in nature in animals, right? So you have an internal representation, maybe a Boolean representation, right? And of course, there is a supervisor who is essentially, you know, telling you what the code is supposed to be. And uh, at the end of the day, machine learning, you know, is based on something like this. You are given an input, right? Then you have a, a target, somebody who is essentially telling the machine, right? what you are expected to see in output, right? And at the end, we have, uh, uh, let's say, wonderful mathematical frameworks for, you know, driving the evolution of the weights in the neural networks with, I'll say, you know, spectacular results in, in a number of fields, okay? So essentially, we are uh, borrowing from biology the principle that learning consists of an appropriate change of synaptic connections, but, uh, of course, um, the connections with biology, I would say, you know, are mostly limited to an, an inspiration from biology. Of course, uh, uh, what you have, uh, you know, is mostly, you know, methods based on, on mathematics of optimization and then very important software uh, technologies, right, which uh, are playing in a very crucial role in addition to the availability of big data and, you know, strong computational, you know, capabilities. The third component in, in my own understanding is the, uh, the, 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 you know, evolution of software technologies, uh, which are supporting, you know, this kind of ideas. And of course, what we have seen in the last, uh, let's say, roughly, uh, I would say nearly 10 years, maybe less, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, five, ten years, we are seeing, you know, a, a different way of uh, designing uh, these neural architectures. So we started in, in, in the last, uh, in the past centuries from architectures where you have just a, one in a layer and then we increase with deep networks. Uh, and, you know, there is this interesting understanding of uh, abstraction, right? So uh, essentially the information uh, from the input is progressively process with the final purpose of obtaining a very abstract representation, right? And, and at the end of the day, you know, these are working in a, in a very nice, uh, well, are working, uh, they are very good uh, mathematical frameworks uh, once again, and, uh, you know, uh, technologies, connected technologies. So, um, deep learning is mostly, you know, the success of uh, powerful internal representations of different layers. So for people who is curious in computer vision, for example, can inspect what happens during the learning in the internal layers of, of the neural network and can be, of course, impressed by the uh, interesting uh, uh, discovery of uh, uh, visual features. So that's, uh, you know, a, a success for sure. Uh, so if you look at concrete um, performances, uh, so we have seen impressive uh, improvements which have, uh, you know, dramatically changed the community, for example, of speech recognition, language understanding, you know, uh, but, also, uh, but also computer vision, right? So for years and years, uh, we, uh, people, you know, uh, who uh, received uh, an education in, in machine learning, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, the, in the last century, uh, was dreaming of uh, huge uh, labeled databases. But of course, we have to wait for the development of the web and for the development of, you know, this possibility of uh, uh, labeling data. 
uh, for uh, obtaining big results. Uh, you may know that in computer vision, one of the, uh, let's say, milestones uh, for the impressive result that we have nowadays was the uh, interesting approach by Professor Fei Fei Li in Stanford. Uh, she introduced this uh, very nice way of, uh, uh, you know, a crowdsourcing system for labeling uh, for labeling images, which is exactly as I was telling you something we were dreaming, you know, last uh, century, uh, the availability of big labeled databases. And so anyway, the technology, the basic idea were very well known, but uh, we had to wait for uh, the development of technology. So we have seen recently the development also in graph neural networks, uh, something in which, uh, you know, I was uh, myself interested more than 10 years ago, but I, I have to admit that, uh, you know, most of the results was due to, you know, the industrial uh, applications and, you know, the involvement of companies like Google. Uh, so, for example, especially DeepMind uh, provide an important role in the evolution of graph neural networks. So, um, now I think, uh, you know, you may ask yourself whether what we have seen in the last, uh, you know, few years is really a paradigm shift in artificial intelligence, right? In the sense of uh, epistemology. Um, well, uh, what we can, can can say for sure is that um, the founders, um, let's say the fathers of, of deep learning, and so I'm mentioning typically Professor Hinton um, and then, you know, um, Professor Lecan and, and Professor Benjo, you know, they actually contributed uh, and they have, in my understanding, the, the fundamental intuition that uh, what we knew right years ago was already enough for uh, facing grand challenges right so i think uh, you know it was uh, uh, an important step right because uh, you know many other people were neglecting you know the importance of this technology and and they were just uh, you know very uh, concrete in in pushing these technologies but, uh, well, we may ask, you know, from uh, an epistemological point of view, um, I'm, I'm quoting Thomas Kuhn, uh, who wrote, uh, uh, um, you know, a sort of uh, milestone in, the, in, in epistemology, the popular book, uh, The Structure of Scientific Revolution. And so we may, uh, you know, ask ourselves whether, you know, we, are, we have really seen an, a sort of uh, paradigm shift well, probably we are still in a sort of existing uh, scientific tradition in terms of, uh, you know, the methods. Uh, we have seen uh, important methodological contributions, but it looks like, you know, most of the success once again is due to the huge availability of data, to the uh, computational resources and to the wonderful and very professional development of software which, you know, has completely changed the picture of uh, studies and applications in the last few years. So let me, you know, propose you this uh, slide, you know, uh, uh, since there are um, uh, people from companies, uh, you know, and, and maybe uh, I hope, uh, you know, research agency, look at this picture here, right? So you can think of uh, um, Santa Claus as the metaphor for a research agency and so you may ask yourself uh, the following right so this guy who you know is potentially one who uh, possess a lot of money and want to uh, support an important project in artificial intelligence you know is is telling the following right somebody told me you have got access to you know of course it's referring to scientists right so he, he's saying, somebody told me you, are, you have got access to a lot of training data that you use for massive learning tasks. That's fine. You, uh, you have also got computational resources for learning, right? And somebody told me that learning research labs last a few minutes only or hours, weeks at most. Why don't you let your computer learn just like children? Isn't the case that your artificial learning saturate soon? Okay, so uh, in this slide, you know, what I want to convey is just the, 
the principle that uh, uh, you know no matter whether the experiments uh, you know are carried out in, in one of the most prestigious research lab in France or let's say in China right uh, well uh, we essentially share the, the, the same methodology right in the sense that uh, you know we have our learning systems and we uh, uh, train our learning system in the lab uh, with, with you know the database but we don't have generally speaking the capability of uh, designing you know systems which can let's say really live in their own environment right and to progressively learn and acquire uh, cognitive uh, skills so that's you know one of the most uh, interesting challenges in my understanding for the years to come okay so um of course uh, learning you know by continuously interacting from the environment just like children seems to be uh, a very important challenge right so think for example in computer vision but also in you know in in language uh, i think it's a great challenge so of course we are in front of uh, uh, you know one corner uh, of the study which i label as the quality of intelligence so we are not only you know likely interested in performances we we we, we want also to you know understand the quality of intelligence so uh, this is just for you know thinking of a transition from artificial intelligence you know where as you can see here there is a big eye to artificial intelligence with you know uh, a big uh, uh, a big eye right so that's the transition that uh, you know i foresee for, uh, for the next few years uh, and they require the shift uh, which you know i think has to do with the quality of intelligence right and uh, of course the general comment is that nothing seems to prevent machines from exceeding human intelligence uh, it depends of course on, on on the specific topics we are covering so uh, have a look at this video for example you know uh, this is a video which can you know was created let's say maybe more than 15 years ago i think so look at quality of intelligence, right? So look at the, uh, at the Rubik cube. So that's in Italian, right? It was uh, in the popular Rai uh, TV. And you see, this is a, a very small robot which was created, you know, 15 years ago uh, with just a toy, right? Because this is Lego. And it was just, uh, you know, created during you know, um, uh, a, a student assignment in, in my course of artificial intelligence. So why am I presenting, you know, this uh, quite uh, now popular methods, right? Simply to show you that there are uh, tasks where, you know, the uh, capability of artificial intelligence, right, is, um, you know, is such that uh, you, uh, let's say, you can overcome uh, the uh, performances of humans, right? So we already have context where artificial intelligence, you know, uh, is definitely uh, superior with respect to human intelligence. In some games, right, it is definitely uh, better, right? So in, in problems like the one I, I, I've shown, and there are a number of, of cases where this is true. Uh, so for example, if you look at linguistic games, right, um, there are a number of challenges, like you probably heard about the, geo, uh, the Geoparty Challenge by IBM. Um, you are not likely um, aware of other challenges like cracking crosswords. Uh, so you're given crosswords and you want to, let's say, solve crosswords or generate crosswords. You know, these are linguistic games. In artificial intelligence, we have this kind of competitions. So, for example, we were many years ago involved in this kind of challenge challenges and well, you know, uh, you have a, if you have a problem like cross cracking crossword, you have, of course, to answer all the clues and fill the grid properly. Right. Uh, just like, you know, uh, uh, just like humans. OK. And the interesting thing is that it can be done in a very successful way. So, for example, we design a system called WebCrow, which uh, use the web for, uh, you know, uh, uh, asking uh, questions, right? So essentially, you know, you take uh, one uh, 
clue and then you pose a question to Google just by, you know, interacting with the API and then you have uh, document backs, you uh, back, you process the, you know, the, the return document and you can, you know, provide a list of candidates and that's, uh, you know, what you can do. And, and it's nice, you know, you can get a very good performance. Uh, as you can see, we are talking about 15 years ago and the performance is, uh, were pretty good. So, for example, you know, we uh, were capable of uh, winning a, a competition years ago in uh, on this linguistic challenge and also the new scientist, you know, was mentioning this success, but well, it is not a real success because, uh, for example, we, reali we realized just a, a couple of years later that, uh, you know, the, these performances uh, are good when compared with, uh, you know, typical uh, person who are not expert in crosswords, whereas if you, uh, for example, uh, have a competition with humans uh, who are expert in crosswords, uh, you know, uh, uh, we don't, we, we, we cannot really uh, succeed. And this is interesting, right, because it's telling you that uh, regardless of the power of computers, we as, there is still a gap concerning language. So the quality of the linguistic understanding is still quite poor and you know to the best of my knowledge for example this uh, crossword challenge and this is still open right uh, maybe in the next uh, few years we'd see uh, a software capable of uh, winning but this is just to tell you that the quality of intelligence uh, very much depends you know on the problem at hand right so anyway, uh, this is again to tell you that we are in front of poor quality of intelligence in language. Uh, and uh, again, more than a decade later, some progress, but quality I think is still arguable. So uh, in computer vision, we recently received, you know, uh, I don't know whether you have been exposed to these kind of messages, but for example, British daily newspaper The Guardian reports computers uh, now better than humans are recognizing and sorting images, right? And it was based on a on a on a paper, a scientific paper from Baidu, scientists in Baidu. Well, uh, of course, I don't want to challenge uh, this paper because I'm confident, you know, it is uh, it was properly reviewed and uh, it was exposing, uh, let's say, uh, good results and, you know, without. Uh, so I don't want in, in no way I want to make claims against, uh, let's say, what they are stating, but the problem, uh, it, it seems to me that it is based on a very artificial check with respect to, you know, what the actual quality of vision is. So look at this, I'm confident there are a number of people in this virtual room who have been exposed to this picture because it has become a very popular picture, right? So people is talking about, you know, this per wonderful performance of computer vision, but somebody else, uh, you know, uh, is saying, oh, are you sure? So look at that. Uh, this is a school bus, right? And so there are some people who decided to do the following experiment. You take this picture here, you have this noise, right? And you end up into this picture. Apparently, you know, if you look at these two buses, you know, they are more or less the same, right? But if you have a neural network, uh, which, uh, you know, perform very well on, on object recognition, as soon as, you know, this neural network is exposed to this uh, uh, perturbated image, you see, come up with a decision that uh, this bus is an ostrich. Well, you could say, what? Ostrich? So you could say maybe it's just a case. Well, uh, this is a case, unfortunately, with a big A and a small I. Look at this, you know, this is yet another example. So enjoy this one. Or if you like, enjoy this one, right? Uh, you can see this guy here uh, who decided to dress, uh, you know, these glasses and suddenly, you know, his identity become the identity of famous actress uh, Milia uh, Jovic, right? So that's nice. You see that you can perturbate just a few things in a picture and you change dramatically your decision. Well, this is not good. So as, as a statement like, you know, uh, computer vision now is superior to humans with respect to performances 
probably need to be, uh, let's say, a little bit, uh, uh, well, at, the, at least analyzed carefully. Uh, well, I'm strongly convinced that uh, there are very serious problems in terms of performances that are mostly neglected because, of course, scientists are just like any other person in the, you know, in the planet, right? They, uh, of course, uh, we are conservative, right? And we, the, since we don't have other methodologies, of course, we are pushing the best that we have, and we don't really want to stress, right, the, the, the very serious problems that, uh, you know, are just uh, behind the corner. But unfortunately, you know, uh, the, these problems are, are just there, okay? Well, of course, uh, uh, you can fool uh, machines in traffic signs, and so anyway. Uh, so, uh, well, I think, you know, for the years to come, one interesting uh, evolution, as I said at the very beginning, will be in developmental intelligence, right? How to, let's say, think about a sort of pre-algorithmic step where instead of immediately, you know, thinking of uh, algorithms for intelligence, you start thinking about laws of nature and laws of intelligence at a sort of pre-algorithmic uh, level and later on, you know, uh, you end up into algorithms. Uh, probably, you know, this uh, is important because we have to understand how many wonderful intelligence uh, mechanisms uh, take place in the brain. But maybe not just by understanding the brain, but understanding the law of, of intelligence, which are likely to be independent of our, of our biology. So, um, of course, uh, the, the rule of time, you know, in the sense of physics, I think is important, for example, in vision, okay? So we, we, we have been acquiring huge databases, right? And people is uh, essentially stressing the importance of acquiring huge databases. I'm strongly convinced that this is not the right direction. And it is not the right direction simply because, you know, we possess uh, devices that can acquire information continuously. So maybe the big challenge is the one of, uh, you know, processing the information online, just as human do, right? Of course, uh, it, it makes sense to uh, accumulate databases if you are a company and you, and of course you have to deal with, uh, of course, your uh, daily business, right? Uh, but not on the long run, at least that's, you know, my intuition. So, uh, if you look at the quality of intelligence, I think, you know, uh, the quality of intelligence need to uh, reconsider uh, systematically what we have been doing so far. Uh, in vision, for example, uh, what I will show you now is something which is a little bit embarrassing, right? This is uh, a collection of images that you can see from Im ImageNet, you see. It is probably, you know, for humans, it is impossible to learn, I think, from such a random distribution. But normally, you know, humans learn in a completely different way. It is very well known that uh, uh, newborns uh, have a sort of blurred vision of pictures and gradually uh, the learning consists of, uh, let's say, protecting themselves from information overloading, uh, something that we are ignoring. So, for example, we focus attention, right? And so nowadays, uh, you know, we have de uh, been developing mechanism for focus attention, which probably, you know, is going to improve uh, the possibility of uh, learning. And, and the same, you know, also for the connection between learning and logic, right? Um, because uh, the relationship between learning and uh, 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 symbolic representation is definitely, you know, uh, important. Machines also need to explain their decisions, right? It is very popular in, in some fields like medicine, but not only in medicine, right? Maybe also in many other business fields, like, you know, just think about insurance companies or, or banks. Uh, in most cases, you know, you need to explain your decision, which is, you know, something which goes beyond the uh, the learned connections of a neural network. And so I think it's time to bridge these different schools of artificial intelligence. One which is rooted on, let's say, symbolic reasoning, and the other one on, uh, uh, you know, statistical machine learning. 
Um, I want to complete, you know, my, uh, you know, my uh, presentation today by showing you some intuition where, you know, you can see a, a, a wonderful uh, possible evolution of creativity and how, you know, machines and the quality of intelligence of machine, especially when, you know, circulating with the intelligence of humans can give rise to some uh, interesting thing. So uh, look at this, um, I'm writing fictional, rea fictional reality. So there is a creative loop here as an example, you know, so suppose you are watching uh, an audience here, like uh, when there is a, a rock star, uh, you know, playing uh, at a stadium or also in a, during a football uh, game. And interestingly enough, what you can think of, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the mechanism, the global mechanism that can emerge, you may think about uh, those guys, you know, who uh, decide to, uh, uh, you know, to tweet uh, their impressions, their emotions, for example, in front of a singer. And uh, well, you can think about, you know, the possibility of processing all this information and produce a visual pattern directly on the audience. But uh, probably th this is definitely difficult to understand if I don't present, uh, let me see if I have a slide where, yeah, maybe it's better if I begin to show you this slide. So look at this slide. Um, what you see now is uh, what we have done in my uh, department. So you see some students there uh, with a smartphone, right? And you see the, you know, they are essentially composing a sort of video, right? So this is a sort of emulation of a radar, okay? So you see, uh, they are, they looks like pixels, right? So, so that's the Italy flag, right? Oh, look, so you have, a, so we could do the, the France flag, right? If you like. Of course, you see the resolution here is very bad but you can clearly distinguish the green, the white and the red, depending on the position. So, of course, we can just, uh, you know, send uh, the appropriate information in the mobile, right? Depending on the position of the students, okay? So, for example, let's see, uh, this is waves. So look at how beautiful, you know, you can uh, create waves, right? Um, and of course, once again, you need to know the positions, right? And we have technologies for localizing uh, the, these guys. And, and look at this. Uh, essentially, what we do now, we will write Siena. So you see there is an S, I, E, N, A, right? So ju just to tell you that it's possible, you know, if you have an audience, a big audience, right? It's possible with this technology, you know, to uh, uh, let's say to use, right, a big uh, crowd of people just as a screen, right? And so you can think about circulation of, uh, you know, uh, this cognitive skills, right? Because you can take these tweets coming from, you know, people in the audience. You can generate, essentially, you can generate a visual pattern which is later on you know uh, uh, visualized on the screen uh, so there is a uh, this is one of the uh, possible examples where you know the quality of intelligence uh, can you know becomes extremely interesting because you see this circulation of creativity right uh, uh, because uh, you know, uh, circulation of creativity has to do from you know with the technology that now they nowadays people are studying uh, considering the generation from text to images, right? So it's possible, you know, to have also textual description uh, and then to generate something which is, uh, you know, uh, related to the textual description. So, um, okay, um, I want to uh, complete my talk uh, by uh, emphasizing, you know, uh, a new framework of competition in science and technology uh, that seems to emerge if you look carefully, you know, at, at what happens in the last, uh, you know, decades. Essentially, you know, this is a picture where I did my best, you know, for understanding the evolution of computer science, right? So a number of people in this uh, audience uh, 
very well, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, appreciate, you know, the this picture and understand what what happened, right? So you see this evolution, okay? Uh, so you see the evolution of, of uh, personal computers, and then, you know, now we we are back again to uh, let's say companies. Uh, which are relying on cloud computing, but it could be the case that now, you know, uh, this interaction between thin clients and uh, let's say big uh, cloud systems will, let's say, pose also the challenge of uh, creating intelligence in, in uh, you know, in thin clients, because these thin clients nowadays are very powerful. And uh, it could be the case that if you just uh, remind what I told you about computer vision and uh, language interpretation, maybe you don't need big database. You need to continuously acquire the information and to develop uh, new methods for learning, which can likely, you know, also work at, uh, you know, at, at the level of the single, uh, at the single thing clients. Okay, so uh, the focus could be more, you know, on mobile and, uh, well, of course, you uh, need to rethink carefully uh, what intelligence is, and uh, uh, we need essentially to reinvent many of the methodologies that uh, we have uh, nowadays, right? So, for example, in uh, in, in vision, uh, I uh, I'm one of those people who is promoting, you know, the the idea of developmental intelligence and especially, you know, this idea of checking the performances of uh, visual linguistic skills continuously, uh, you know, outside the lab, right? So in, in, that's uh, you know a, a way, a different way of thinking with respect to benchmarks, which of course are extremely important. But it's important at the same time, you know, to see how systems uh, work uh, in our own environment. So uh, just to make, a, to draw a, a few conclusions, um, I did, uh, you know, I emphasize the importance of quality of intelligence in this talk and the importance of uh, looking at foundations of learning theories for language and, and vision which are based on developmental intelligence, where, you know, developmental intelligence means, you know, the stress on a gradual evolution of intelligence, which somehow, you know, need to protect uh, also intelligent agents from information overloading. Just like, you know, there is a, uh, let's say, a very intriguing protection uh, in newborns, right? Newborns are capable of, uh, developing visual skills and language skills thanks to their focus of attention mechanism, which, you know, protect them from the exposition to, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, let's say, a lot of information, right? And so this is what we, I think we are missing nowadays. And uh, it's like, at least in my understanding, one of the most uh, interesting uh, research direction, together with uh, the interpretation of the interplay between symbolic and sub-symbolic representations, right? When we use sub-symbolic representation, we typically refer to, you know, the, the process uh, that we experiment in neural networks, for example, where the, the information is, uh, you know, and the knowledge is, is represented by real numbers. And of course, the big challenge is that we want to construct machines capable of explaining their decision. And of course, uh, as I, you know, I concluded uh, with, with the emphasis of, uh, you know, this uh, benchmark that instead of, uh, you know, being only based on statistical tests, it could be probably simply based, you know, on the judgment that uh, is continuously uh, could be continuously proposed by people, for example, using crowdsourcing methodologies. And uh, yeah, so just uh, want to complete by telling you that um, uh, probably, you know, a number of people, at least, uh, you know, colleagues of mine, uh, sometimes, you know, say that um, in the last few years, we have seen an, an impressive growth of uh, 
uh, knowledge also not only of technology but also knowledge in big companies and then in that uh, you know the kind of research we carried out in our labs maybe cannot compete with the uh, let's say the research carried out in 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 uh, uh, top level labs in uh, uh, in important companies i think you know they are right if you consider the state of the art of technology in artificial intelligence because nowadays you know uh, the technology of deep learning i think have reached a sort of maturity and i'm confident that uh, it's really very hard to compete with you know with companies uh, who which have already developed uh, you know internally this technology and uh, you know they have a lot of experience and a lot of structure but my feeling just to complete and to close this lecture is that uh, you know uh, this is true but uh, uh, you know it could be a terrible mistake to believe that uh, uh, now uh, we already have developed uh, you know the methods the, the good methods for intelligence as i wrote we are strongly uh, using a big a so the component of artificial in my understanding is really big which means that uh, you know of course uh, we are in front of, uh, of very good performances because you know the the, the uh, technological steps uh, are really big because of the powerful of computers but uh, uh, you see what i wrote in green my understanding is that we have been facing problems more difficult than than those posed by nature the uh, example I typically put on the table is computer vision. Uh, essentially, the technologies that we have nowadays, you know, face computer vision by learning from images. And I'm, I'm convinced that uh, this is going to offer a challenge which, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting. We have seen that we can uh, obtain very good results but also there are big failures, uh, as I showed you during my presentation with this uh, funny adversarial attacks. And, you know, uh, what we are totally missing is the, uh, the temporal coherence, which in my understanding is the secret that nature, you know, put in vision for allowing animals to learn. And, you know, I'm confident that uh, uh, when uh, some labs in, uh, you know, will discover uh, how to deal with the temporal coherences, the performances will improve dramatically. So uh, thank you so much for your kind attention and for the opportunity you got me to uh, express my view uh, this afternoon. Thanks, Thanks very much, Marco, for uh, your brilliant uh, vision and view and sharing that uh, with us. Um, I have a question which is uh, similar to the one I asked uh, Stefanos and which corresponds to what you say as uh, the future of uh, deep learning and uh, explanation uh, expected from uh, deep learning. Uh, you talk about bridging logic and machine learning and uh, as a path to the future of uh, AI and um, in order to achieve this how do you see it do you see an, an enhancement of deep learning platforms new hidden layers or whatever or the reverse enrichment of rule based systems etc how do you see we can bridge that uh, uh, th that yeah. uh, dimension okay yeah thanks uh, uh, serge i think uh, you know we have already you know some uh, answer uh, so for example there are a number of uh, um, attempts uh, to bridge technologies of uh, deep learning and more traditional um, let's say models like uh, remember the expert systems model uh, of, the, of the down of artificial intelligence so, but generally speaking let's say symbolic uh, uh, models so one possibility is, of course, to design software systems where you have different modules and to, let's say, properly design these different modules, right? So this is going to become a sort of software engineering problem where 
you properly analyze the problem in front of you and you uh, design the solution uh, which better, uh, let's say, uh, which is suitable for the, the problem at hand. And of course, this makes sense. But uh, I think the most interesting challenge is another one. Because if you look at the methodologies that we have uh, uh, from the symbolic and sub-symbolic sides, uh, you early recognize that uh, they, uh, let's say, are strongly based on different schools of thought. So, for example, the, the traditional symbolic reasoning um, is based on uh, uh, the, the typical logic deduction mechanism, right? So you have methods for representing the knowledge, uh, you have databases and you have knowledge bases and you have inferential mechanism which are based on, uh, let's say, the traditional theorem proving uh, logic uh, mechanism. And from the other side, uh, you, are, you mostly rely on, uh, let's say, calculus uh, and uh, statistical uh, background. And of course, uh, it's quite difficult, right, uh, for scientists to provide a sort of, uh, you know, uh, conjunction in these two different uh, schools of thought. And, and, and so the, the big challenge is how, you know, can you think about also mathematical settings which can somehow unify right there's two different approaches and there are a number of uh, possibilities uh, you know which uh, you know for, for some people um, they well that there is a, a, a research direction where um, you mostly use uh, probability theories for uh, uh, you know attaching a sort of probability to some rules Right, so that's a way of, uh, let's say, expressing a, a certain degree of uncertainty in the decision. But there are also some more, uh, let's say, uh, deep uh, changes where instead of, uh, you know, uh, expressing the logic in the traditional Boolean sense uh, with true and false, you have, uh, you know, a sort of, uh, let's say, degree of membership of a certain property, right? Uh, it's like when you say, you know, a point, uh, whether or not uh, a, an element belongs to a set, right? You have a sort of fuzzy membership. And so when you uh, start to consider, you know, this possibility, then there are some interesting uh, way of composing, right, the, the learning with the reasoning. And, and which can at the same time, you know, expose the capability of learning uh, and especially learning in a perceptual environment where you have, for example, speech and, and language. But at the same time, you know, the important capability of uh, providing, a, a, let's say, a sort of uh, symbolic understanding of what you, are, uh, you have been doing. OK, thank you very much, Marco. Uh, for your answer, but that's a fascinating area and that's of prime importance anytime you are applying deep learning to medicine, as you say, where we need to uh, get some explanations on the decision which are taken. Yeah, medicine is definitely one of the most uh, challenging contexts uh, uh, because, uh, yeah, you have uh, a strong components on strong components in the perceptual field because you have signals, right? Images, and then you have uh, any kind of signal. But at the same time, you have uh, important information coming from patients, right? So uh, that's why it is very important to. Uh, uh, to join this uh, these different technologies. And uh, concerning um, your personal activity in your research center at the University of Siena, which are what are the two or three major areas of research in AI uh, you are conducting? Well, um, uh, le le let's think about, you know, uh, the, the most important one, right? We, the, then, of course, we have a couple of activities which uh, uh, then are, uh, let's say, connected to the most important one. I'll say uh, is the one where um, has to do with vision and with uh, ling linguistic interactions. So, um, uh, let's say, it's an attempt to uh, evolve the capability of uh, 
software and so visual agents simply, you know, by interacting with the environment. So without training on labeled databases. So to be more explicit, uh, we have designed uh, a virtual system, uh, which is essentially, you know, a graphical system, uh, an environment which is typically the one you see when you use computer graphics, right? So you enter this environment, which is a virtual uh, world with objects, right? So you you are in an apartment and you see all the objects that you see in an apartment. So nowadays, as you know, they, uh, they are very photorealistic. You know, the quality is really impressive. And so essentially we assume uh, that uh, uh, we want to design software systems with capable of living in this environment, right? And to explore uh, the environment just by living inside and while living inside, you want to learn, right? And, and then you start to interact with people, okay? By asking questions and, and so on and so forth, just like children, okay? And the purpose of this agent at the end of the day is to uh, learn to recognize objects and to pose questions and interact with humans concerning this visual environment, okay? So that's the challenge one of uh, you know uh, uh, gaining uh, cognitive skills uh, by living in an environment and not because uh, let's say you learn from huge databases which have been predefined by someone okay so the assumption is that on the long run that this agent uh, uh, after let's say you know after a while will get off the virtual world for experimenting, you know, what happens in a real environment. So that that's, you know, essentially the idea. And of course, um, this is, uh, as you likely understand, quite a complex project with a number of uh, different uh, topics, like I was mentioning, you know, the creation of this graphical environment uh, and, uh, for example, uh, the studies on vision and the studies on language. Uh, so there are a number of people who have been working on the project uh, with different uh, roles. But uh, coming back to your question, you know, it's essentially one. So uh, um, and then, of course, we have other students in our lab who have been doing uh, very nice work in, uh, you know, with colleagues in our university, uh, uh, mostly, you know, uh, colleagues in uh, in the genetic in the department of genetics uh, and others you know uh, people uh, connecting with dermatology so we have also you know uh, some students uh, working on uh, uh, application of medicine right uh, th these are essentially the the two fields thank you marco a question from uh, my students in nice i would like to expose here yeah. uh, is um, to become an expert in uh, deep learning, do you need to be a mathematician or not? Yeah, well, that, that's that's an interesting question, uh, I think, right? Um, of course, I... You, you could extend it to the researcher. If you want to be a researcher in deep learning, and then if you want to be an engineer in the market, yeah. it could be something different. But yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely, because I'm confident that nowadays, you know, especially because of the uh, impressive development of software methodologies. Uh, remember, I was mentioning uh, the development of software methodologies in the last few years, and I'm confident it's one of the reasons of the explosion of interest in this field. The development of software methodologies allow it, uh, you know, open this field to a lot of people. So there are a lot of very smart people in the field of engineering who, you know, uh, don't really need to understand, uh, you know, the details of what is inside, uh, you know, the, the libraries and, the, and let's say the deep concept without, uh, let's say, artificial intelligence, right? Because uh, uh, you can actually control 
properly the software interface, you know what you know those uh, uh, modules are expected to do. And if you have a, a, a smart uh, engineer, you can design uh, wonderful solutions for a lot of real world problems. So, so there is this side, uh, and I'm confident, you know, this is likely to be one of the most important uh, sides of artificial intelligence nowadays. One of the reasons why probably this afternoon we are here, you know, <laughs> talking about artificial intelligence. So I'm confident, you know, the role of companies and the role of applications in the, is the one which is more important, definitely more important. But then, of course, if on the long run you are interested in, you know, seeing the evolutions, well, it's a different story, right? Because, uh, of course, what you need is the uh, you know the composition of qualities right uh, so you need uh, in in companies and in research centers you need different uh, uh, components of uh, you know di different experiences so when mathematics is needed in my understanding you know a good background in mathematics or even prefer even better a strong background in mathematics is is required if you if your ambition is to deeply understand what will come next, right? Or to be more explicit, if you want to, let's say, contribute yourself to, let's say, anticipate what, you know, will happen next. So that's the point, right? And, and, and I'm confident that without uh, a strong background in, in math, and, and generally, you know, in, in uh, uh, you know, in computer programming, it's very difficult, you know, to uh, uh, produce strong innovation, uh, at least from my understanding. But of course, it's just a, you know, uh, just a small component of the story, right? Because uh, then overall, you know, this, the, the story of artificial intelligence nowadays is much more complex and, and composite. And, you know, there are a lot of things with, where mathematics uh, is not so important, right? Um, well, oh, uh, but to be honest, uh, if you really uh, are interested uh, in, in deeply understanding uh, these technologies, uh, well, uh, uh, it helps a lot. OK. Thank you very much, Marco. As far as I'm concerned and my students are concerned, that's uh, uh, th that were the questions and um, I do not see any other question in the chat. I just put them around. OK. Um, and what kind of mathematics do you need uh, to to be a good researcher in deep learning? Is that a linear algebra? Um, yeah, typically graph theory. Yeah, well, in, in, in we typically what we typically need is uh, yeah exactly measure topics in uh, in uh, in calculus, uh, linear algebra, statistics. Uh, uh, whereas if you really want to you know have more interest in connections with uh, other traditional fields of artificial intelligence, uh, it's a different story, right? You also need uh, background in discrete mathematics. Uh, uh, like logic and uh, you know formal reasoning, uh, those are the, the the topics that are likely to be more uh, important at that time. Okay, is there any other question? Um, I ask um, people in the chat to express. If not, I would like to thank you deeply, uh, Marco, uh, for your wonderful talk and uh, visionary talk, and uh, we will. Um, be happy to keep on collaborating in the future and uh, building Absolutely. this French Italian connection. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks for inviting me and of course I'll be pleased you know to continue especially you know uh, to contribute to, to the link uh, between the universities so we have this official link now and it yep. could be interesting to you know start to, start to to also with students you know to exchange students is one of the uh, the most interesting thing. So we will, we will succeed and we will do pretty things for the students, I'm quite sure. OK, thanks Thank again. Thank you very much, Marco, and see you soon with pleasure. Bye bye. Bye bye. And take care. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.